Okay, so the topic is ATV on the microwave band. Um, as some of you have known, we've been uh, playing, and, and it's digital TV really we're talking about, apart from uh, 5.6 gigs. We've been playing for uh, a few years now and uh, producing some surprisingly good results by combining our digital amateur television techniques from the lower bands and uh, our microwave uh, narrowband transverters. So um, I'm going to give a, a quick overview of what amateur television is, uh, some of the transmission modes, and then get into what we're doing on the microwave <coughs> bands. And this really splits into two sections. One is looking at analog on 5.6 gigs, because we are still using analog very much so. And that, to be honest, is the easiest and quickest way to get going on the microwave bands with amateur television. Then we'll look at digital television generally, what's happening, the trends that are happening there, and how we've applied that to the higher bands on 10 gigs, 24 and 76 in particular. And then um, I, I almost felt obliged to put that last section in. <laughs> um, it would have been rather remiss, I think, to, uh, to do a talk this month without mentioning uh, the uh, Oscar 100 uh, satellite transponders. So, um, uh, for, the, for, the, for clarification and benefit of uh, those, you know, we're talking about fast scan TV. This is not uh, Italian test cards with naked ladies on them. Uh, we're talking fast scan TV. And when we talk about amateur television, it includes video production, editing, and transmission. Um, and as mentioned by Derek, the uh, British Amateur Television Club, of which I'm on the committee, uh, covers all aspects. We encourage members to, to do everything from you know, classic camera res uh, restoration, live pictures, uh, although sometimes I have to admit, and you'll see this in the video content later, I do have to admit that we, we would be better off re recalled, uh, retitled the British Amateur Television Transmitting Club. Um, we, seem to, we seem to measure on the transmitting side rather than the, uh, the video quality side, so uh, that, uh, that's, what, that's what we do. <coughs> so the modes that we use, um, AM, 70 SEMS AM back in the 80s, yeah, how many people can put their hands up to that? Well, I'm afraid AM is probably AM is probably the one mode we really don't do much of these days. And primarily on 77s, we don't use it anymore because it was rather wide. And so the whole of 70s there, which was a bigger band than it is now, um, you could occupy with one nice power signal and some uh, sound. These days, on 70 centimetres in particular, we've moved towards digital, where we can do everything uh, that you used to do in 8 megahertz down to a, a maximum of 10 megahertz. We still use FM. Uh, FM is used on 23 SEMs and uh, uh, 10 gigs. And in particular on 6 SEMs or 5.6 <coughs> gigs we use FM um, at 27 megs deviation. Uh, the, real, the real interest and real developments are in digital where we use the DVBS standard, um, and we use that on all bands in various bandwidths. Um, we don't tend to use DVBT. For those of you who do know what that is, that's the uh, the Freeview standard. And the reason why we don't tend to use that is because the PA requirements are are much harder. Plus the fact it's not variable bandwidth; it's generally fixed bandwidth um, down to a minimum of two megahertz. So we don't tend to use that. And included on this really is internet streaming. We, we tend to use the internet as a tool to uh, really complement the hobby. So uh, we do quite a lot of internet streaming of repeaters and things like that. Very, very useful tool and important part of what we do with Amazon Television these days. So band by band and um, We've really done quite well in the last few years on Spectrum. We've lost some space on the higher bands, but um, 71 and 146 megs, uh, we've been given the, uh, the NOVs by Ofcom 
we've got a one megahertz at each one of those bands and given that we run narrow band TV we can run full color TV on, on 71 and 146 <coughs> megs. In fact some of us have experimented down at 50 megs as well. So um, there's a lot going on in the, the LF part of the spectrum um, but as we go up 70 centimeters we now uh, based around 437 megs we, um, we run up to 2 megahertz wide of uh, digital TV there. 23 SEMs, that's um, analog and digital, and there's still a lot of 23 SEM repeaters around, and the nearest one being the Bristol uh, repeater here. 13 SEMs, if you look at your license, you know you lost 40 megahertz, but there's still a lot of 13 SEMs left possibly going to be less so in the future. I think that's one of the bands that's really under threat. But there's still room and we do uh, repeaters and simplex there. And of course that's where the Oscar 100 uplink is. The uplink to the new satellite is at uh, 2400. 3.4 gigs. We've lost spectrum there but there's still 10 megahertz. So there's plenty of room for the narrowband people and also some digital television channels at the uh, top end of the 10 megs and we've got several repeater outputs at 3.4 gigs seem to be very easy to get licenses for and work surprisingly well a lot better than uh, 2.3 gigs mainly because it's a much lower noise up there uh, 5.6 gigs we'll come on and talk about that in a moment 10 gigahertz we're still pretty active with TV at 10 gigahertz and that's of course where the downlink for Oscar 100 is. And then 24, 47 and 76 gigs. We'll talk a bit more about that shortly as well. So one of the messages I want to get across today is 5.6 gigs, ATV is easy. Under 20 pounds, you can get on 5.6 gigs the uh, analog television by buying the drone transmitters. The little drone downlink transmitters, less than 20 pounds each for a pair, probably 60 milliwatts out, uh, sorry 600 milliwatts out, uh, minus 85 dBm which is pretty good for a 27 meg wide transmission and the transmitter <coughs> and the receiver are tiny, you can see them in here and the great thing is that although they are really designed to cover the legal channel for them in the UK a lot of them also cover one segment of our amateur band down at 5.665 megahertz. And they just work out of the box. It's amazing. Um, they, uh, you can take them and you can wire up uh, power, video and audio, connect an antenna. What antenna? Well, a 5.6 gig Wi-Fi antenna will do. Or um, a sky dish available from your local tip um, and if you put a feed on it and they work tremendously the most expensive part of the system if you weren't careful would be the antenna changeover relay but <coughs> not run two plates <coughs> so you can run two flat plates next door to each other one with the transmit on it and one with the receive on it and you've got a system that works so what can you do? Well, line of sight, 50 kilometers, no problem. Um, the best DX, for those who didn't cheat with Tropo, <laughs> 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 is 153 kilometers. Um, it's quite interesting. We've been, we've been struggling and struggling and struggling to increase this distance. It was going up by 10K and 10K and 10K. And eventually uh, some guys went out and did 153k and then last October there was an enormous tropo lift and Sean GVPG who is here went out to uh, a site on the Mendips and worked uh, Rob M0 DTS up in uh, under North Yorkshire Moors which uh, instantly took the record up to 350 kilometres. 370 actually. No. 370? <laughs> oh, I, I stand corrected. <coughs> and that's all with £20 tool. pounds worth of kit off eBay, yeah. plus an antenna. So, you know, this, this really is amateur television at its easiest, and you can get out and have some great fun. Uh, one of the clubs up north made it a club project, 
Um, great club project. This uh, the guy at the top there. He was a member of the uh, the Furness Club up in Cumbria, and they made this a club project. And they've had great fun out on the uh, the hills doing 5.6 gigahertz point to point. Um, we think it's probably backpack portable. Not that some of us entertain that mode, but uh, there's no reason why you couldn't do that backpack backpack portable on your local hilltop. So very simple, very low entry, gets you an interest in microwaves because there are guys, particularly in the Gloucester area, who've been using exactly the same equipment to do just voice, not TV, but just voice, and they put entries into the UK microwave uh, contests as a voice entry. So you know this is really accessible stuff. Um, and the types of paths you will work, it's a very uh, flattering picture, sure. <laughs> <coughs> so that's uh, 111 kilometers, as you can see, it was uh, slightly obstructed, but it still worked. This one is from Cleve Common, near Cheltenham, down to Dunkery Beacon, just behind Minehead, 136 kilometers, line of sight path, all on you know, the standard eBay kit. So if you want to get into microwaves and you want to get into ATV, there is no easier way. It really is that simple. However, life is uh, always slightly more challenging because that's the way we like it. So analog, uh, digital TV, re oh, sorry, amateur television really is going digital. Um, really because it's a new challenge and because there is spe pressure on spectrum. And so, back in the uh, about 15 years ago, we decided we would adopt commercial standards purely because it makes it easier to get equipment. <coughs> um, however, we have made life more complicated for ourselves because we have reduced the bandwidth and reduced the bandwidth such that we are now sending live TV pictures below 100 kilohertz wide. And DVB-S2 and also the new video code XH265 achieving some pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal results at below 100 <coughs> kilohertz wide <coughs> bandwidth. The obvious benefits, analog versus digital. Um, it's uh, self-explanatory. <coughs> and picture quality wise, generally, um, I mean, these pictures were taken 15 years ago. I would think it's significantly better than that now. But this was just flipping between analog and digital at the same powers. But I would think now, with the techniques we're now using, you would have a hard job resolving some analog pictures and getting a, a, a proper digital picture. Because what we've done is, we took the DVB-S standard, and if you look at the S standard, it goes down to 1.5 mega symbols per second, <coughs> which equates to about one and a half megahertz if you're running half FEC. That was fine, but we really wanted to do stuff a lot narrower than that. And so we came up with the idea that we could reduce the DVB-X bandwidth down below um, the one and a half mega symbols. And in fact, we're taking it right down to below 100 kilohertz now. Unfortunately, that did have an impact that we could no longer use normal domestic equipment. You could no longer, I used to say, you could pop into Macklin and buy a receiver, but you can't pop into Macklin anymore. So you could have gone onto eBay and bought a free-to-air receiver. But when we went, when we tried to reduce the bandwidth, uh, this no longer became the case. And so we've developed amongst the community, we've developed both transmit and receive products, which really enable us to drive down to below 100 kilohertz wide. Now the benefits of doing that are obvious, that we are, the power bandwidth ratio, um, you gain 3 dB every time you half the, uh, the bandwidth. So right down at 100 kilohertz, we're achieving some pretty, uh, pretty interesting results. And what we've seen recently on the satellite is that <coughs> DVB-S2, when you're in 500 kilohertz, can be decoded with uh, 
just about 5 dB signal above the noise. So um, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. So TV no longer requires the big link budgets, which we uh, previously thought it did. Um, quick word about DVBS2. <coughs> Up until recently, really, amateur television has been about DVBS, but uh, we're now adopting DVBS2 because the equipment is becoming available. And <laughs> of those of you who know, it operates much closer to the Shannon limit, and we've proven recently on the satellite that there is a 2 dB gain between DVBS and DVBS2. And it also, we can operate or we can use higher order modulations. So we can get more bit rate for a given bandwidth. And that, of course, is the reason why the satellite operators adopted S2 in the first place. Because in their case, they could get an HD channel where they were previously getting an SD channel. It gave them that, that greater increase in bit rate. So if this is the Shannon limit, the red dotted lines, DVBS sits down here. Um, and here's the S2 lines. Depending upon the mode you're running, the S2 lines. So what you can see here, the difference here, is a couple of dB. And that's purely by switching modes from DVBS to DVBS2. And what we found, as I say, 2 dB difference between the two modes. And also the ability to run higher payloads. And this is a screenshot of an S2 signal. You can see the 32 APSK constellation in the window. And that, uh, that was some 1920 by 1080 video, which is what you would know as HD video, in 500 kilohertz. Five. <coughs> On 146 meters. Actually, that was, uh, that was Mike MJW received myself. <coughs> it was only over a couple of miles, but on 146 meters. So how do we go about getting on uh, ATV? Well, this slide really is a bit of history. Initially, we started off running commercial encoders um, because some of us worked in that industry and went and visited the skip on a, at lunchtime. Uh, but things have moved on significantly since then. And we've been through, uh, there has been a number of pieces of equipment available for the amateur market. Uh, things like the thing called the SR systems who are in Germany. The VATC marketed a unit called the DTX-1, which was a combined uh, encoder and modulator. Um, then first, the first real piece of SDR or FPGA hardware was a thing called DATV Express, which uh, several of us still run today. But today, really, the only, uh, the easiest and most practical way to get on board is via a, um, what we know as the ports down, which is Raspberry Pi based and enables you to do pretty much all of the modes and all the simple rates that you would need to do. So the port stand is a, is a BATC project. Just check time. Uh, BATC project, and it, today it's based around the Raspberry Pi and the Lime SDR. Um, and the great thing is about it, it uh, you can't go to Martin Lynch and buy it. It's, uh, it's real, real stuff, you know. So if you combine this, combine this with microwaves, it's really what I think radio, it's real radio, real hand radio. <coughs> and it will do, with the Lime, it will do 28 megs to uh, 3.4 gigs, MPEG-2, MPEG-4 encoding, all of the modes you would need to do. A uh, quick block diagram. There's somebody in the audience who's much more capable of talking about this block diagram than I am. But uh, Dave GKQ over there is the uh, main developer project lead for the port stand. <coughs> but essentially, it is a Raspberry Pi. We do a GPIO extender card, so you don't have to go down on the header. <coughs> you can have nice screw terminals to ring the wires out. And over, uh, connected via USB, is the Lime SDR. <coughs> So inputs, you can have video, so composite in, um, a sound dongle. So you've got video capture, sound, or you can use the Raspberry Pi camera or a webcam. Comes in Raspberry Pi with a touchscreen controller. 
so it's all touch screen. Um, and then on the output, live SDR, you can do a variable digital attenuator. Uh, we've done an eight band switch, so the output of the SDR uh, live mini can be put into an eight band switch, so you can do transverter switching and also the PTT steering. All of that is available. Uh, all of the cards we sell PCBs for, but it can build up into a pretty comprehensive system. So, uh, touch screen interface, cards available, uh, SD card available from us. You don't even have to program the SD card. And, as I say, it will do 30 megs up to 3.5 gigs, 88 killer symbols up to 1 mega symbol with the LIME, MPEG-4, MPEG-2 encoding, PTT band switching. And it's not just a, a DATV system, Dave's also put in spectrum monitor, um, an FM receiver, and uh, hopefully in the future there'll be a, a signal generator as well. So that's what we'd suggest is probably the easiest way to get on air with digital TV. To receive it, again, because we're not using uh, standards anymore, we had to come up with our own solution. And the we the hard, this is in two parts, so the hardware is a PCB and tuner which is sold by the BATC and software written by F6DZP. And this will do all of the symbol rates you require to do even the amateur television right up to satellite television. And that's a, that's a picture of, Os that's from Oscar 100. And you can see the type of quality we're receiving <laughs> and if you look over here, you'll see that was in one or uh, a thousand kilo symbols, i.e. one mega symbol. So that's about one, just over one meg wide. Um, and the other interesting thing is, look, it's DVBS2. There's the constellation, not, <laughs> of what is being received there. And we're operating really low down at thresholds, but particularly on Oscar 100, it's it. There are stations where you just can't see the constellation forming. It's unbelievable the performance we're getting out of these systems now. And, and the video quality, you know, that, that's, that's pretty good. Um, the other thing that going digital has taught us, which is a bit of a revelation for amateurs, but for those who uh, study uh, digital communications, this is probably no surprise. Um, You've got to forget the S meter. And these are some screenshots which were done by the developer of the uh, PC software showing that you know the signal level is not everything. On the top one, he's showing minus 36 dBm as the signal level. Uh, look at the constellations, QPSK, fairly tight, fairly tight constellation, and no errors. And if you put noise on the channel, or if you put interference on the channel, or phase distortion on the channel, you can still have the same signal level, but the constellation is much more blurred, and you're starting to get error correction to the point where you need so much error correction that actually he's lost lock at that point. And this is something new that we've had to understand, and is important when we start to talk about the microwave bands and how we apply these techniques to the microwave bands. So how do we get onto the microwave bands? Well, actually, it's not that difficult because traditionally we've done DATV on 144 or 432 mix. And light bulb moment, most of our microwave transverters have an IF for 144 or 432. And so once you've sorted out the switching issues and drive levels, to get onto the microwave bands with digital TV is pretty simple. And there are several people in this audience who've actually followed exactly that route and done some pretty interesting things on the microwave bands with the, uh, digital TV. <coughs> so, in theory, up to 3.4 gigs you don't need to worry because if you buy a Lime SDR, that actually does it directly. But if you want to go on the higher bands, it's all about taking what is your standard narrowband transverter and doing some switching down at this end 
possibly with an attenuator or maybe a, a drive amplifier <coughs> to balance up what you need for the transmit side. On the receive side, it's pretty much just plug and play. And so, if you were to take a, a typical 10 gig system, um, in my case, it was the ports down system at uh, 432. I needed a bit more drive because obviously all of our systems are set up for FT uh, 817s or whatever, which produce a watt or so. So, a bit of a drive, a bit more drive at uh, VHF into the standard Kuhn transverter, mm -hmm. and then on receive, Kuhn transverter just drives the mini tuner. However, there was one got you that we didn't see coming. Uh, we thought that if you know if a system in, was engineered to do good SSB, it would be fine for digital TV. But what we didn't realise was how critical single carrier DVBS was going to be on phase noise and phase distortion. And what we found is that you have to take some precautions on eliminating phase noise for digital TV and it's much more critical than sideband and so for instance we use a an LO strip to get to 24 gigs which is basically a a 12 gig local oscillator chain um, turned it fine on that and uh, on that narrow band as soon as you went to wide band, uh, as soon as you went to digital TV even though you still had the signal strength, we just couldn't get it to work, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, I actually use the same strip to get up to 76 <coughs> gigs, and so it's all the more critical, because as you multiply up, you multiply your phase noise. So this is a picture of Dave GHEKQ signal on 3.4 gigahertz, and you'll see we've got plenty of signal strength, and it was a good clear line of sight path. But look, that's the impact of phase noise on his transmitter is blurring the constellation around the line. Now, interestingly, we know exactly what the problem was here. It was a Lime SDR, and it was a very, very cold day. It was a cold day. And what we found is that when the line got up to temperature, the phase noise corrected itself and we had a fine constellation. So, um, but that shows you exactly what phase noise, poor phase noise looks like. And the, impa the impact is that the modulation error rate was down at 10 dB. Now, over this link it was fine because it was... It was actually cheese foot to Hannington on the day that you were there as well, Nick. And plenty of signal strength, clear line of sight path, a low MER didn't matter. If this signal had been down in the noise, such as the Oscar 100 signal we saw earlier, this additional errors on the phase noise would have just taken it down. It would have been unreadable on a poor path. So whilst it, I mean, we've only got 10 dB in hand, we should over this link probably have 25, 30 dB. So phase noise, particularly on, we stumbled across it on 24 gigs to start with, it is, it is a significant factor on the higher bands. So a quick summary of what we've done. Um, 10 gigs DATV, this was the first test we did, we did 92 kilometers. Um, no, sorry, that's 138 kilometres on 10 weeks. That's Dunkery to Cleve Common. Um, again, during the lift last year, Adrian, uh, the DX was 138k, the real DX was 138k. During the Tropo last, uh, last October, <coughs> Adrian down in Taunton worked uh, Rob up on the York Yorkshire Wars on digital 10 gigs, digital ATV, 407 kilometres, wintry. tree. Oh, just move on now. Sorry? <laughs> just move on, you've got to just look. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> <coughs> um, 24 gigs, same architecture as 10 gigs, standard transverter, 
Uh, power levels around about a watt. Um, this one, I, Dave and I do hold the record still. <laughs> 85 kilometers, uh, low worth down to uh, weather down. Um, the world record is only 120 kilometers. I'm sure this one can be beaten. Um, this was this was the 85 kilometers. I mean, look at those uh, constellations. You know, that's that's not going to be difficult to do. So 24 gigs, plenty of room for uh, maneuver there. It, there's a challenge. Um, we we know where we need to go, but we just haven't got round to going to meet it. So. 47 gigs. I could only show one picture because there's only one one station active. So Dave G4FRE has been up on 47. Uh, he had a one-way QSO out affordable back to home. <laughs> he lives he lives on the edge of edge of the hill in Malvern, so he's very good in one direction. And that's uh, 35 kilometres, and that's he said he said 0.2, but I'm sure it must be two milliwatts into a NEC Paso Mink receiver. So not exactly high tech. But um, there's a challenge. Nobody else is on the uh, 47th. 76 gigs. Neil and myself have been experimenting. Uh, I'm using the UK microwave loan kit. And if you look at this diagram, you'll instantly see one of the problems. We're going up from 12 gigs, multiplied up to 75 gigs to get the LO for the mixer. That's a uh, synthesizer VCO. There's phase noise on it. Um, so it's not only equipment phase noise that we have problems with, but also atmospheric phase <coughs> noise, and we'll, I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Um, we currently hold the world record at uh, 35 kilometres. So this was the first path we did, 28 kilometres from Hannington down to near Winchester. And the FM signal was this. So that, that was what it sounded like on FM, and so we went to TV, and this is, uh, this is what we achieved on TV. Don't forget the, uh, the caveat I gave earlier, or the rider I gave earlier about picture quality. It's um, for the British Amateur Television Transmitting Club. Constellation was uh, something hand there. The, uh, this was filmed with an iPhone off my PC screen, which is why it's a little uh, why you've got the patterning as well. And the wobbliness. Right, yeah. <laughs> Bit of feedback. It's not a rucksack, really, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> so that was uh, that was the first attempt. We uh, that was uh, 28k. So then we went out again on a very very cold, windy day in January to uh, to try and increase that. And so we went up to uh, Coombe Gibbet, which is basically Walbury, and that was the uh, that was the shot. Anyway, in the distance you can see, right on the distance, there's a bit of a lump, and that's uh, Chiefsfoot. Now, interestingly, this path didn't go. 
it was surprising. Um, overall path loss 175 dB, that's with a K factor of 1. Um, didn't go, did it, Neil? We don't, we don't know why. That's the view I had. Um, it just didn't work. So I then went around the corner, just down the side, if you like, over there by about three kilometres to a second path. Now this was, this was only 2 dB less. Um, and you, you'd look at that and think it was probably not as, not as clear. But this, this did go on, on TV. Um, um, unfortunately, I only recorded, or Neil only recorded my test card, but honest, that's, that's video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that video is running as we speak. Um, so it's, um, it's strange. We, we don't understand why that first path went. And, uh, sorry, the second path went and the other one didn't. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to, uh, to know why, but uh, we think it was probably atmospheric. So it was a bit of a strange day, wasn't it, Neil? It, it, because the two metres wasn't particularly loud on that first part we did. For some reason. Yeah. And, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> and, and also, the word, it wasn't so much lack of signal. Again, we think it was probably atmospheric distortion. I don't know. So what next? Um, we would like to try a longer path. Um, Neil is adding an image filter. He didn't have an image filter at 76. So we believe that may give us 3 dB more possibly and improve the noise figure. Um, we'd like to increase the phase noise on the LO, but we're not quite sure how. Um, yeah, difficult to know. Right, very quickly, and it will be quick because I'm from time to time, and also we're going to talk a lot more about this at another event. Um, the real game changer for television is the uh, Oscar 100, and it's really proving to be very successful. Um, hopefully you're aware that there is a spectrum monitor on the web where you can see all of the ATV going on, the activity, but unlike the narrowband segment, we haven't got a decoder online and so if you want to receive the signals, you really need to have your own receive system. Um, but that's not too demanding. One meter dish, uh, an LMB, and one of our USB uh, receivers, and you will be able to receive the uh, TV pictures. Transmit, we're finding you probably need about 30 watts and a, and a one meter dish. So um, ports down with a line mini, PA, and a, a 1.2 1, 1, 1 1 meter dish. But as I say, we'll be covering this in much more detail at the, uh, the BATC meeting in Bristol on uh, March the 31st. So, you know, we, we're really seeing a bit, a bit of a golden age for ATV. We're, uh, we're really pushing it forward. Um, we've seen a big increase in the BATC membership. And we're doing some really interesting things with uh, and what we would call is uh, real radio. You know, it's, uh, combined TV and microwave, and I think that's really the, the sweet spot of uh, experimental and amateur television right now today. So, there we go. That's, uh, that's all I've got to say. There's some web links there. The easiest thing to do is just Google the BATC wiki, and that will take you right to where all of the information is. The wiki has really turned out to be the the go-to place for information on any of this. So, uh, BATC Wiki, and if not, there's a, as I say, there's a meeting in two weeks' time, three weeks' time? <coughs> two weeks. In, in Bristol. Okay, any quick questions?